The Flying Trunk by Hans Christian Andersen. There was once a merchant who was so rich that he could pave the whole street with gold and almost have enough left over for a little lane. But he did not do that. He knew how to employ his money differently. When he spent a shilling, he got back a crown. Such a clever merchant was he. And this continued till he died. His son now got all this money, and he lived merrily, going to the masquerade every evening, making kites out of dollar notes, and playing at ducks and drakes in the seacoast with little gold pieces instead of pebbles. In this way, the money might soon be spent, and indeed it was so. At last, he had no more than four shillings left, and no clothes to wear but a pair of slippers and an old dressing gown. Now his friends did not trouble themselves any more about him, as they could not walk with him in the street. But one of them, who was good-natured, sent him an old trunk, with the remark, Pack up! Yes, that was all very well, but he had nothing to be packed. Therefore, he seated himself in the trunk. That was a wonderful trunk. So soon as anyone pressed the lock, the trunk could fly. He pressed it, and whirr! Away flew the trunk, with him through the chimney and over the clouds, farther and farther away. But as often as the bottom of the trunk cracked a little, he was in great fear lest it might go to pieces, and he then he would have flung a fine somersault. In that way, he came to the land of the Turks. He hid the trunk in a wood under some dry leaves, and then went into the town. He could do that very well, for among the Turks, all people went dressed like himself, in dressing gown and slippers. Then he met a nurse with a little child. Here, you Turkish nurse, he began, what kind of a great castle is that close by the town, in which the windows are so high up? There dwells the sultan's daughter, replied she. It is prophesied that she will be very unhappy respecting a lover, and therefore nobody may go near her unless the sultan and sultana are there too. Thank you, said the merchant's son, and he went out into the forest, seated himself in his trunk, flew on the roof, and crept through the window of the princess's room. She was lying asleep on the sofa, and she was so beautiful that the merchant's son was compelled to kiss her. Then she awoke and was very much startled. But he said he was a Turkish angel who had come down to her through the air, and that pleased her. They sat down side by side, and he told her stories about her eyes. He told her that they were the most glorious dark lakes, and that thoughts were swimming about them, like mermaids. And he told her about her forehead, that it was a snowy mountain with the most splendid halls and pictures. And he told her about the stork who brings the lovely little children. Yes, those were fine histories. Then he asked the princess if she would marry him, and she said yes, directly. But you must come here on Saturday, said she. Then the sultan and the sultana will be here to tea. They will be very proud that I am to marry a Turkish angel. But take care that you know a very pretty story, for both my parents are very fond indeed of stories. My mother likes them high-flown and moral, but my father likes them merry, so that one can laugh. Yes, I shall bring no marriage gift but a story, said he, and so they parted. But the princess gave him a saber, the sheath embroidered with gold pieces, and that was very useful to him. Now he flew away, bought a new dressing gown, and sat in the forest, and made up a story. It was to be read by Saturday, and that was not an easy thing. Will you relate us a story, asked the sultana, one that is deep and edifying. Yes, but one that we can laugh at, said the sultan. Certainly, he replied, and began. And now listen well. There once was a bundle of matches, and these matches were particularly proud of their high descent, their genealogical tree, that is to say, the great fir tree from which each of them was a little splinter had been a great old tree out in the forest. The matches now lay between a tinderbox and an old iron pot, and they were telling about the days of their youth. 
Yes, when we were upon the green boughs, they said, then we were really upon the green boughs. Every morning and evening, there was diamond tea for us. I mean, do. We had sunshine all day long, whether the, whenever the sun shone, and all the little birds had to tell stories. We could see very well that we were rich, for the other trees were only dressed out in summer, while well, our family had the means to wear green dresses in the winter as well. But then the woodcutters came like a great revolution, and our family was broken up. The head of the family got an appointment as mainmast in a first-rate ship, which could sail around the world if necessary. The other branches went other places, and now we have the office of kindling a light for the vulgar herd. And that's how we grand people came to be in the kitchen. My fate was of a different kind, said the iron pot, which stood ne next to the matches. From the beginning, ever since I came into the world, there's been a great deal of scouring and cooking done in me. I look after the practical part, and am the first here in the house. My only pleasure is to sit in my place after dinner, very clean and neat, and to carry on sensible conversation with my comrades. But except the water pot, which sometimes is taken down into the courtyard, we always live within our four walls. Our only no newsmonger is the market basket, but he speaks very uneasily about go the government and the people. Yes, the other day, there was an old pot that fell down from fright and burst. He's liberal, I can tell you. Now you're talking too much, the tinderbox interrupted, and the steel struck against the flint so that sparks flew out. Shall we not have a merry evening? Yes, let us talk about who is the grandest, said the matches. No, I don't like to talk about myself, retorted the pot. Let us get up an evening entertainment. I will begin. I will tell a story from real life, something that everyone has experienced so that we can easily imagine the situation and take pleasure in it. On the Baltic, by the Danish shore. Oh, that's a pretty beginning, cried all the plates. That will be a story we shall like. Yes, it happened to me in my youth when I lived in a quiet family where the furniture was polished and the floors scoured and new curtains were to put up every fortnight. What an interesting way you have of telling a story, said the carpet broom. One can tell directly that a man is speaking who has been in the women's society. There's something pure runs through it. And the pot went on telling his story and the end was as good as the beginning. All the plates rattled with joy, and the carpet broom brought some green parsley out of the dust hole and put it like a wreath on the pot, for he knew it would vex the others. If I crown him today, it thought, he will crown me tomorrow. Now I shall dance, said the fire tongs, and they danced. Preserve us! How that implement could lift up one leg! The old chair cushion burst to see it. Shall I be crowned too? thought the tongs, and indeed, a wreath was awarded. They're only common people, after all, thought the matches. Now the tear was to sing, but she said she had taken cold, and could not sing unless she felt boiling within. But that was only affectation. She did not want to sing except when she was in the parlor with the grand people. In the window sat an old quill pen, which, with which the maid generally wrote. There was nothing remarkable about this pen, except that it had been dipped too deep into the ink, but she was proud of that. If the tea urn won't sing, she said, she may leave it alone. Outside hangs a nightingale in a cage, and he can sing. He hasn't any education, but this evening we'll say nothing about that. I think it very wrong, said the tea kettle. He was the kitchen singer and half brother to the tea urn that the rich and foreign birds should be listened to. Is that patriotic? Let the market basket decide. I am vexed, said the market basket. No one can imagine how much I am secretly vexed. Is that a proper way of spending the evening? Would it not be more sensible to put the house in order? Let each one go to his own place, and I would arrange the whole game. That would be quite another thing. Yes, let us make a disturbance, cried they all. Then the door opened and the maid came in, and they all stood still. 
not one stirred. There was, but there was not one pot among them who did not know what he could do and how grand he was. Yes, if I had liked, each one thought, it might have been a very merry evening. The servant girl took the matches and lighted the fire with them. Mercy! How they sputtered and burst into flame! Now everyone can see, thought they, that we are the first. How we shine! What a light! And then they burned out. That was a capital story, said the sultana. I feel myself quite carried away to the kitchen, to the matches. Yes, now thou shalt marry our daughter. Yes, certainly, said the sultan. Thou shalt marry our daughter on Monday. And they called him thou, because he was to belong to the family. The wedding was decided on, and on the evening before it, the whole city was illuminated. Biscuits and cakes were thrown among the people. The street boys stood on their toll toes, called out, huzzah, and whistled on their fingers. It was uncommonly splendid. Yes, I shall have to give something as a treat, thought the merchant's son. So he bought rockets and crackers and every imaginable sort of firework, put them all in his trunk, and flew up into the air. Crack! How they went, and how they went off! All the Turks hopped up with such a start that their slippers flew about their ears in such a meteor they had never yet seen. Now they could understand that it must be a Turkish angel who was going to marry the princess. What stories people tell! Everyone whom he asked about it had seen it in a separate way, but each one, one and all, thought it fine. I saw the Turkish angel himself, said one. He had eyes like glowing stars and a beard like foaming water. He flew in a fiery mantle, said another. The most lovely cherub peeped forth from among the folds. Yes, they were wonderful things that he heard. And on the following day, he was to be married. Now he went back to the forest to rest himself in his trunk. But what had become of that? A spark from the fireworks had set fire to it, and the trunk was burned to ashes. He could not fly any more and could not get to his bride. She stood all day on the roof waiting, and as most likely, she is waiting still. But he wanders through the world, telling fairy tales. But they are not so merry as the one he told about the matches. Thus ends The Flying Trunk by Hans Christian Andersen. <laughs>